told you. Like, I told you so. One of those solid strategies. He said, sure, Sarah, you can join the family business part-time and do inside sales. I said, I don't care. I just want to make enough money to send these babies to daycare. That's all I want to do, Dad. And so over the course of the last 10 years, I have had the opportunity to walk alongside dealers and manufacturers like yourself to help implement processes and give you hope. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about processes for hiring. So I'm just kind of curious, how many of you have come to the Expo, whether we're going to call it the Equip Expo or the GIE Plus Expo, I'm probably going to slip, slip up a few times, I'm just going to be honest with y'all. Alright, how many of you have come to the Expo, this is your very first time, let me see your hands, very first time. Oh my gosh, alright, let's give everybody a quick round of applause for that. Alright, how many of you, you have been coming for between one and five years, let's see your hands here. Alright, very good. How many of you have been coming for more than 10 years? Anybody in the more than 10 years? All right, how many of you have been coming as long as the show is open or you feel like it has? All right, I see. That's fantastic. Um, as a company, what we do at the core is, I would say, we are the Gordon Ramsay of kitchen nightmares for dealerships. Okay, that's what we do. We walk alongside dealerships just like yourself and help implement processes and parts and service, and as well as the other management side of the business. But here is the ultimate difference between us and Gordon Ramsay. Are you ready for this? We have to be a lot nicer to technicians than he is to chefs because clearly it's much easier to find chefs than technicians. Would you agree? <laughs> like, that's the strategy. I don't know how he does this. And he's like, do chef, do chef, do chef. We can't do that with technicians. We're like, oh, we know that you're a terrible person and we don't want to be around you, but you will do. Like, that's what we have to do with technicians sometimes. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying steal them from the dealership down the road, but I'm 
are currently employed. Would you all agree with that statement? And so it puts us in this really precarious position, this really uncomfortable position, that when we're looking for people, how do we find the ones who actually want to work, who will show up on time, or at all, show up consistently, and come in with a good work ethic? Is that even something? That's what I'm going to call the mythical unicorn in this situation. And again, most of these people are already employed. And so the questions we have to ask ourselves is how do we really define who it is we need so that when we have the opportunity to hire this person, we are hiring the right person for our dealership. I read a book probably 10 years ago now called Hiring Smart. It was a book from the 70s, and the gentleman who wrote this book had a mathematical equation to figure out how much it costs you if you hire the wrong person. He said, if you hire the wrong person, the cost, if you keep them for only six months, the cost to replace that person is one and a half times their annual salary. Okay, one and a half times. And that's if you realize you made a bad hiring decision and you replaced them in six months. How many of you have made a bad hiring decision and kept them for longer than six months? Oh yeah, my dad's not in the back raising his hands, so I'm really thrilled about this problem. <laughs> Congratulations. And so we have this, and so that means that $700,000 is what it costs us if we keep somebody and just hold on to them for six months and we have to replace them. So when we look at this, we have to realize that the problem that we're dealing with is not only like a hiring problem, but it's a money problem for you as well. Like this sucks up your hard-earned, well-deserved net profit at the end of the day if we aren't addressing this effectively. So how in the world do we actually go about finding these mythical unicorns? The first thing we have to do is we have to identify what their pain point is with their current situation. Okay, that's the very first thing we have to do. Now, if we want somebody who's already has a job, maybe they're happy, maybe they're not, we've got to identify where is their pain with the situation. Now, it may not be the same pain point that you think it is, off the top of your head. How many of you have ever had the opportunity to do a home renovation with your significant other? Let me see your show of hands. How many of you are still married to show about that? Okay, that, see that's impressive. That's impressive. Like honestly, you could be marriage counselors after this. I'm really excited for you. There's like another career path for you. My husband and I have an 1880s home, the home built in 1880, we live in a historic downtown area of our One and a half, because in the 1880s, apparently, they could stuff a lot of people in these houses and nobody needed to stay off and share back there. We have three girls in our family. So my husband, me, and then we have three daughters. One and a half bathrooms, as our girls are entering their teenage years, was not going to exist, right? Anybody else have daughters who are in the teenage years? Our support group later will be fine. Uh, so as we walk through this, we said, this is not going to touch. My husband had a home improvement business for about four years, and so you know, we said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a master bathroom audition. Oh yeah, this is going to be good. This is going to be the most fantastic thing we've ever done. It's going to add value to our home. And it's going to be such a beautiful bonding thing for us. <laughs> no, it was not a bonding thing. Honestly, the amount of counseling we had to go through to get through the bathroom, we should have just hired an ass. Anybody else been there before? You're like, yes, that's what we should have done. But here's the deal. We had a pain point with our house. When we started and got this house, our girls were young. It wasn't a big deal. We're like, we can share bathrooms. But as they got older, what became really apparent to us really quickly? That wasn't going to cut it. That absolutely was not going to cut it. That was our pain point. We didn't know it when we stepped into the house. But as we spent time there, that's where it was. So what does the pain point look like when we're looking for employees? Maybe it's flexibility. Maybe at the job that they're at right now, they don't have the flexibility that they need. Maybe it's money. That could be a piece of it. Maybe it's the environment that 
She's my absolute clone. And in this situation, I am clear that if I had a million Ellas running around, the world would probably self-destruct in some sort of way and would not be positive. But here's the deal. When we're looking to hire people for our dealership, you know what we typically do? We hire people who are just like us. We hire people who are just like us. People come into the interview and they're like, well, that's if they can show up for the interview in the first place, am I right? Like, if they show up for the interview, they come in and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what it is about this person, but I just love them. They are just fantastic. We just really hit it off. It's because they're just like you, right? And anytime in your dealership, it's so critically important that we are crystal clear on who we need, and we do not need another clone of you to run the dealership. Now, I want you to think about this in different positions inside of the dealership specifically. In the service department, we typically need to find somebody who is focused on processes in the service department. We want somebody who has some attention to detail and loves to solve problems and puzzles. We always can tell a really good technician is a good technician because they are fantastic puzzle solvers or problem solvers, okay? That's who we're looking for in the service department with technicians. In the parts department, we want somebody who is so analytical and is so paying attention to details that if you were to make one minute mistake when it comes to a detail, they would call you on it and point three. They should be. They should be. That's who we need in the parts department because we want to make sure that our inventory is right, that our cash drawer is right, and that customers are being taken care of in a concise and succinct way. In the sales department, do we want any of those two people in the sales department? Have somebody come out and help do 
story. I want you to think about this as a viable strategy for filling spots inside of your dealership. Now, the spots that I see this being filled inside of your dealerships are like processing warranties. We have a number of people who do a really good job at warranty processing for you. How many of you really enjoy processing warranties and doing warranty submissions? No, one? There's one person. Like, you're a saint. Okay, you're a saint. Nobody really enjoys doing that. And to hire somebody and to train somebody to come on to your team to do that, what kind of commitment is that from you? It's a big commitment, right? That's a big commitment. And so when we can find things inside of our dealership that we can outsource instead of bringing them in, it's a win-win in so many ways. A few things that happen when we don't hire but we outsource. One of the first things that happens is they are not on our payroll. Oh my goodness. As a business owner, how thrilling is it that you can have somebody working for you that is not on your payroll, that you're not paying unemployment taxes on, social security taxes on, and maybe even health insurance on, but they are an independent contractor. That's one of the huge wins. The other thing that happens is that if they don't work out, you don't have to fire them off of your team. That's a huge piece of it too. You know, over the last year, I have constantly looked at this space of saying, what does it look like to outsource not only positions inside of our organization, but positions in dealerships that we're working with? And it's been a pretty incredible thing to see. There are so many sites out there that allow you to do this in easy ways, like Fiverr. How many of you have used Fiverr before? Does anybody use Fiverr? This is an online website where you are connected with freelancers all over the world who can do things like create all of your marketing material for you. Yes, that's not a joke, it's a real thing. And it's just for a few dollars per thing that you need. There are other resources like Time, etc. that prepare you with someone they would call a virtual assistant. This is about $250 a month, you get 10 hours of their time, and they can do everything from data entry to for you, to actually helping coordinate calls with customers and getting things scheduled. This is a fantastic way if we need somebody to coordinate for us. Maybe it's even keeping your business management software up to date and making sure that our customer lists are correct. People from all over the world, and Time Extender is a US-based assistant, so they're all based in the United States. But people from all over the world have all of these skills that you need as small business owners. And our first instinct as small business owners is like, you know what, let's just bring them on the team. More the merrier. We love the first and the 15. Let's go. Come on in. The water's warm. No. We've got to think about this just a little bit differently. So again, think about outsourcing your warranty, outsourcing your marketing, and finding someone to support you on the data and analytics side of your business. All three of these are pieces that if you aren't outsourcing or you don't have someone in your team doing this, it's probably following you as the owner and manager to do this. So find that support, and again, it's relatively inexpensive in comparison to actually bringing someone onto your team. The second thing I want you to do that I would consider an unconventional strategy is use job recruiter sites. Now before you throw tomatoes at me, rotten tomatoes for clarity's sake, Let's talk about job recruiter sites for just a second. I'm just gonna be completely honest, we're friends at this point, so we're just gonna have a really honest conversation. The reason job recruiter sites like Monster or Indeed or ZipRecruiter are not working for you is you're using them wrong. That's what the issue is. The reason they're not working for you is you are using them wrong. When we look at job recruiter sites, we have to realize that job recruiter sites utilize search engine optimization. How many of you know what the word search engine optimization means, or SEO for short? All right, now that is a whole bunch of marketing terms, but let me break it down for you. When you go on to Google and you want to find a place that has the best beef jerky in all of Kentucky, you type in beef jerky, best beef jerky in all of Kentucky. And then magically, the top three recommendations for the best beef jerky in all of Kentucky pop up in one, two, and three. Have we all experienced that? Maybe it's not beef jerky, maybe it's fish and bowls, maybe, I don't know what it is for you, okay? I don't know what it is for you, but it pops up one, two, three. The reason that goes top up to the very, very top of the search results is because the websites have used search engine optimization, or SEO for short. Now, that really just says we have so many keywords on this website that when somebody looks it up, where results are going to come to 
to the very top. If you have a marketing company helping you with your website right now, I'm confident that the reason your website performs well is because they use so many keywords for their job posting. So you can use any of them, whether it's ZipRecruiter, Indeed, Monster, whoever it is that you feel in your soul is the best option for you. But here's the things you need to do. Number one, the job description. We're going to be clear, we're going to be concise on who we need. We clarify that in the first piece of it. The second thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that we have salary ranges on our job postings. You go, but Sarah, what if the other employees see it? Well, the other employees see it. I mean, number one, they're looking for a new job. Okay, so that should be a clarification piece for us. Number two, we should keep our job, our pay structure in line with what we're doing. So we're going to talk about how much we can really afford to pay in just a minute. But we need to make sure that the pay is in line with where we need to be with all of our employees. But I would say, number one's our red flag. If they're sitting on a job report site, it means they're looking for a new job. So that should be something. Some of them you'd be like, here's the door. Have a nice life. But like some of them you're like, whoa, don't leave me. Don't leave me. Don't let that happen. All right, so when we look at the job recruiter site, we've got the right job description, we've got a pay range, and we start the search. We're so excited, said Sarah, so this is going to work. Well, the things that we've got to keep in mind is that we've also got to make sure we're posting when people are actually looking for a job. Right? When are people actually looking for a job? If we know the fact that most, if not all, of people who are looking for a job are currently employed, any of them we would want right now are probably employed, when would these employed people be looking for a job? <coughs> when? When you got your paycheck, I respect that. Yeah, absolutely. What else? What else? Recession. Recession, okay. What else? There's some else. Beginning of the year. Beginning of the year. All right. What I see on a more microscopic level is that people start looking for a job on after they get off work on Friday afternoon. They're in the car, driving home to their boo, and they're like, listen, I can't believe I have put up with this stuff for so long. They don't, they don't appreciate me here. Can you believe I put so much work in for so little money, and all I get is just no thanks or anything. Have you guys heard this conversation happen? Yes. Maybe you've had the conversation with the owner. Okay, that's a whole different conversation. <laughs>
there is a tool called Keyword Planner. Keyword Planner. And Keyword Planner on Google was originally created for ads on Google. Okay, so they wanted you to be able to pick the keywords so that your ads would show everywhere you looked. I love that for them. We as entrepreneurs have made the decision we're going to use their free resource for something else. Okay, can we agree that? Alright, so what you're going to do is when we're looking to figure out the keywords, we're going to do it in 63-ish simple steps to figure this out. I promise it won't be 63 steps. It's a lot simpler. So the first thing you're going to do is you're simply going to go Google Keyword Planner. The one that's going to pop up is choose the right keywords with our research tools. That is what we are going to click. That's going to be the first thing that we click when we're looking for it. When that opens up, there is going to be a spot that says choose the right keywords. And you're just going to simply click go to keyword planner. Okay? So it's going to walk you through this. There is another option on the right side, but the one we want is on the left side that simply says go to keyword planner. After we go to the keyword planner, if my click would work, that would be really exciting for all of us. After we go to the keyword planner, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to click discover new keywords. So what this is doing for us as business owners is it's saying, okay, here is all of the keywords that we know actually correlate with the things that you're looking for. And we want to find those connection points really, really easy. It's going to pull up information for you based on the fact that these are the words that other people are looking for in any given situation. So then we're going to take our job description that we already have, right? We already have our job description. We know what we're looking. And we're going to pick the words that relate to our business and just simply type them in. So let's say, hypothetically, we're looking for a technician. Is anybody looking for a technician right now? Okay, like 90% of the hands went up in the room. Okay, I see you. All right, so let's say we're looking for a technician hypothetically or not hypothetically in this situation. So we're going to enter the words service technician, dealership, service rider, and mechanic. Okay? If you want to add extra words to that, you can, but this is just going to be our baseline. We want to find a technician, so we need to figure out what other words we need to put on that job description so that we pop to the top of that search engine optimization or that job recruiter site. Then, we're just going to simply let the magic happen. After you put those words in, which you can see right here at the top, it's going to say that you can refine your key words. Alright, so that's going to be the next thing we focus on. We've got the words at the top and then we're going to refine the keywords. So it gives us options like brand, trade, vehicle, component, service, or others. And when you click through those, it's going to give you the keywords you need to have in your job description so that it pops to the top of the search engine optimization or your job recruiter site. And so you go, okay, Sarah, I know that you put service technician, I know you put mechanic in there, I know that you put these words in your service writer, but I'm looking for a small engine or tractor mechanic or a technician. Why would I have on there that I'm looking for auto mechanic, diesel mechanic, or motor mechanic? Why would I have that? Because here's the deal. If we are looking for good people for our dealership, if somebody has basic mechanical knowledge, and they are a good technician in other areas, can we train them to be a good technician in what we do? Yes. Is it going to take a little bit of work? Yes, it is. Is it going to take some time and some money? Yes, it is. But if we are in this place that we know that there is very few out there looking for a job who doesn't already have one, we've got to be able to put the work in so that we can move them forward. And so when we're looking at this for the keywords, we're also going to look under service. So I'm saying that if we look at this, there was over 336 people who have searched for the word auto mechanic in the last 24 hours on this specific search. It tells you the actual number of what the ranking is of it. So under service, we'd also have truck repair, diesel repair, trailer repair, mobile mechanic, air conditioning repair, trailer, and I probably wouldn't put city on it, but you could if that felt right in your heart. And so when we have these job descriptions at the very bottom, I want you to simply write keywords and then just literally put the keywords out there on the bottom of your job description. That way, the job recruiter site will see it and will bring it to the top. You go, okay, great, Sarah, that's fantastic. Where in the world do I find these job descriptions? Okay, we in our dealer toolbox have them all done for you. We have a job description for every position inside of the dealership. That 
that is ready to be on Indeed or LinkedIn with some basic edits. We have a deal going on right now, $300 off our toolbox for the year. It's the QR code. It's all we're going to have all week long for you. But if you're looking for a uh, fast forward, easy button on getting those job descriptions done, we've already got it done for you. And at the bottom, you're simply going to find the keywords that you want to put on there and just write them on the bottom of the job description. And then we're going to post it to Indeed, the recruiter, or LinkedIn win. Friday at noon. All right, here's the other thing we've got to keep in mind when we're looking at this. We've got to make sure that we are following up with people who are applying for these jobs within 24 hours and in many cases offering them the job within 72 hours. That's what we're seeing right now. If somebody applies for a job and they are a good technician right now specifically, if they have not been interviewed and offered a job within 72 hours, they have taken it from someone else. That's the statistic right now. And so we've got to be on top of our game. Well, but Sarah, that means that I'm going to have to work through the weekend. Please, you're small business owners. You're already working through the weekend. Don't have that loss on me. That's not loss on me. So we've got to be having these conversations and moving this forward. So I want to walk through the keywords really quick with parts as well. How many of you are searching for someone in the parts department right now? <laughs> About the same hands. That's fantastic. All right, so the keywords that I put in here for this is parts department, inventory management, parts manager, parts support, lawnmower parts. And the thing that it said is right underneath, it says broaden your search. It says business, supply chain management, business processes, small engine parts, power equipment parts, and outdoor power parts. Why does that matter? Because any combination of those words would lead us possibly to the right candidate. Would you agree? Any combination. But we get so laser focused on the words that we're using when we put together a job description that we miss the boat in many situations. All right, so the third thing that I would say that we need to think about in regards to our unconventional hiring strategies is that you need to talk to military recruiters, pastors, and the class clients. That's who you need to talk to when we're trying to find and hire people. Why in the world would we talk to the military parts people over the course of the last few years is military recruiters. This is not a pre-planned program that military recruiters have, but simply walking into the military recruiting office and saying, hey, my name's Sarah, I work down at ABC dealership. Okay, you don't have to say your name is Sarah, you work at ABC dealership unless you feel like that would work for you, then you have full permission to use my name, that's fine. I'm Sarah, I work at ABC dealership, and we are always looking for really good technicians and really good parts people. Do you have anybody who's coming out of the service that's looking for a job in our community? Having that conversation with the military recruiters is an incredible place to start. Because here's the deal, people coming out of the service, number one, they have an incredible work ethic. They have an incredible work ethic. We have fantastic employees who come out of the service every single day. Many of them come with technical skills and backgrounds or inventory management skills and backgrounds. Is there some crossover to what we need? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So we were working with a dealership for our dealer success group program uh, a few years ago, and we were helping them with this hiring process that we do with all of our dealer success group members. And as we were doing this, we, we said, have you reached out to the local military recruiter to find his technician? We were struggling. It was for um, a big ad technician, and they said, no, we haven't. So we reached out and said, hey, we're working with this dealership down the street. They're looking for a big ad technician, can you help us? He said, well, I have somebody who's coming out. Their job was to, they're a technician in the field, and their job was to pull tanks out of red zones, active fire combat zones. And so it's not like a direct crossover, but I think it might be, might be a good fit. We said, fantastic. Let us talk to this person. They're coming back to town. They're going to be here. We want to bring them a piece, part in our community. We love them. We had this conversation with this technician, and here's the deal. He was perfect. He was fantastic. He was coming in. We needed to do some training on how to actually do the technician technical part on the big tractor side of things, but he understood the basic mechanics. We had just a little bit of training to do. We were in the final interview with him, and he said on the phone, Bob was in the he said on the phone, he goes, listen, I have heard that shops in the midst of the busy season is really, really stressful. Do you think I can handle it? <laughs> yeah, you'll be fine. You spent the last four years of your life pulling tanks out of active fire red zones. You will be fine, my friend. Let's go. That was the biggest concern. He can handle the stress of business. He's in a dealership. You're like, sometimes there, it feels like that. 
red zone fire, then we can talk about that's a different conversation. We can talk about shop processes. So talk to your military recruiters. When we look at this, again, this is not a free plan program that they have, but have the conversation that they can do. We also had incredible luck finding people for the parks department in this. We had somebody we hired for a multi-location dealership that was in charge of the parks depot for the military. They came out of the service, and again, they had some learning to do on the specific parts for this dealership, but they understood process management, they understood inventory management, and they understood parts. Can we train the rest? Oh, you bet we can. You bet we can. So I would say start with that. Talk to your pastors. Why in the world would you talk to a pastor about this? You're like, we just need the Lord to intervene in this situation. It's pretty desperate inside of our dealership. Okay. No, that's not why I'm saying you talk to your pastor. Why am I saying you talk to the pastor? Number one, the pastors typically know when there are people looking for jobs. That's the first thing I would say. Pastors typically know when people are looking for jobs. Number two, we've had a lot of dealers have incredible success finding technicians specifically out of cars ministries at their local churches. I don't know if you have cars ministries at your local church or somewhere in the region, but that has been a fantastic place to find technicians. And here's the deal. A lot of the people who are working in the cars ministry at the local church are not technicians by nature. Like, that's not what they did for their career. And so saying, hey, we're looking for technicians gives them an opportunity to say, maybe I want to do a different career path. We've got somebody who's technically done and that wants to help other people and has some basic skills. This is a fantastic place for us to find technicians as we move forward. Finally, the class clowns. Why in the world would we ask for the class clowns in any given situation? This is a conversation that typically happens with the high school teachers. Who are the class clowns in your school? Why would we ask about the class clowns? They're out of the Yeah. They're sitting here. And typically the reason kids are acting up in school is because they're uncomfortable and this is not something that they love. Would you agree? Like, some of us, I was a class clown, and it was just because I was a king of the butt. But, like, most of the time, the class clowns are the class clowns because they feel really uncomfortable in the situation they're in, and they're trying to get attention. And we know that if we can start working with kids in a high school and moving them towards a technical career, that is going to be a huge piece to us figuring out how to make this work. So working with the school guidance counselor to offer programs where we can get kids in high school to come start working inside of our dealership is a fantastic place to start. Start them as a position we call the service coordinator, whose job is to make sure equipment is clean, that we move equipment in and out, and let them start giving an extra set of hands to your technicians. Give them that job after school or in the summer. Their parents will be thrilled because they've got something productive to do, and we're training our next technician. We always want to hire low and grow when we start talking about hiring strategies. So if we can hire at a very low level and grow them into who we need them to be, that is a fantastic strategy to making sure that we have the people we need into the future. All right, so once we look at that piece, and we've got to ask the question, how much can I really afford to pay anybody in this situation? How many of you have asked this question before? How much, Sarah, can I afford to pay a technician, a part person, or shoot, even myself as an owner or manager? All right, if your hand's not up, you're a liar, and I see you. It's fine. I think it's the question everybody has asked. It's, and the answer is really... It depends. I wish I had a better answer for you, but I do. But I do. But here's the deal. When we look at how much we can really afford to pay in any situation, we think about it as salary caps. Now, how many of you love your local sports team and or maybe it's your NFL team, your major league baseball team? Anybody a big raving sports fanatic? One person. I, I don't know. Let me ask that. How many of you is that love a sports fanatic? You love your sports team. I'm from Kansas City. And I believe that we probably have the best quarterback in the whole entire world, but don't get me started. All right, they're like fight wars. Are you from Buffalo? All right, I don't know. That's a whole different conversation for a whole other day. Those are fight wars, Sarah. And so when we think about salary caps in, in Kansas City, here's the deal. We are convinced that there's nothing that a half a billion dollars can't do for you. You two can have the best quarterback in the entire world for a half a billion dollars, okay? And so, but we know that in order for them to be able to pay Patrick Mahomes a half a billion dollars over the course of 10 years, there are other people who have to be paid less so that we can afford him, right? Salary caps. The same thing holds true for your dealership. If we want to figure out how much we can pay in any given situation, we have to just look at the numbers. Now, let's talk about how much we can really afford for to pay in service. We determine how much we can afford to pay in service by looking at our labor rate. That
That is what determines how much we can pay in the service department. Now, in service, we can pay 30% of every labor dollar produced towards technician pay. That's it. 30% of every labor dollar produced can go towards technician pay. So, again, being from Missouri, we've got to keep this math really simple. Let's say that our labor rate is $100 an hour. How much, little Einsteins here, could we pay for a technician if we had a labor rate, A-level technician, if we had a labor rate of $30 an hour? $100 an hour, I think. $30. <laughs> Of our 
gross profit when it comes to sales. Like I can't get good salespeople for 25%. They're just like magical snowflakes in the air. We love them and they think they're the most special people in the entire world. I love that for you. I love that for you, really I do. But at the core, if we don't have these salary caps in line, there's only so much we can pay in the position. If we need to pay one person more, do you know what we have to do? What do we have to do? Pay somebody else less. I mean, that's it. You only have so much money in order to make sure that we've got this set in the right direction. So again, in parts and sales, we've got 25% for manager and employee at salaries, 55% for departmental costing, and 20% for your net profit or reinvesting into the business. All right, the last piece of this is you go, okay, that's great, Sarah. I love that. We're moving in the right direction. I feel like I know what do I need to be looking for. I feel like I know where I should be looking and how I should be looking. And I, I have a rough idea on how much to pay, or at least I can figure out how much to pay in any given situation. So the next question we have is how do we go through this interview process and find somebody without any baggage? The short answer is you can't, right? You can't find somebody with no baggage. We all have baggage. It's just about what baggage you want to bring into your dealership. Now, if we've got somebody who walks in with a sign that says, I hate people, it's probably not the baggage we're going to bring in. But some of you are still like, you know what, Sarah? Right now, I take them. I will take them. If they're going to show up on time and they hate people, I will take them all day long. Let's go. All right, who's in that? Honestly, who's in that song? members that are these cornerstone questions that their entire job is to uncover what bags we're bringing into the dealership at any given point. Okay, there's three questions. The first question that I always ask when we're doing an interview process of any kind, whether it's for our organization internally or for dealerships, is the blank check question. And when I was thinking about the blank check question, it came to my mind really quickly that I feel like checks in and of themselves, if there's anyone under the age of oh, 25 in here, probably don't actually know what that is, but it's something that you use and it's really a wild time. Publishers Clearinghouse also still shows up at your house with them sometimes. I, think. I don't know. Never happened to me, but one time. The blank check question is simply asking the question, when somebody sits down for the interview, the first question I would ask them is, I pull out a legal pad and say, I want you to tell me about yourself. You can start anywhere and end anywhere. Okay, that's the question. I want you to tell me about yourself. You can start anywhere and end anywhere. And if you're going to have a legal pad or a notepad, and you're just going to stand there and you're going to be quiet. That's the most challenging part of asking this question, is you're going to stop talking. And there may be a few moments of awkward silence, and we're just going to sit there, we're going to look at them, and we're going to smile with our pen. We're ready to go. When they start talking, they will tell you things that you could never legally ask in an interview. They may say, you know what, I was born in Minnesota and I grew up on the prairie and now I have seven kids from three different husbands and it's gotten really shady over the last few years and there's some real weird tension. And actually one of them was an employee here, so that's how I heard about you in the first place. But now, in May, every year, I, I'm really involved in my church life has turned around for me. In May every year, I like to go on a six-week mission trip with my church. It's something that's really important. We build houses and it's really important. But I can't wait to work. Here. I'd love to work here. That's fantastic. Okay, was there red flags in there? Oh yeah, there were some red flags, right? <laughs> Sarah, more red flags than we came up back in counseling for four years. No, no, but the biggest thing that I heard in that, well, there's a lot of things, but one of the things you go, oh, you like to go on a mission trip with me for six weeks every month, for every year. Is that a problem for us in this room? Oh yes. Do we have blackout days on vacations in our dealership? We should or we don't, and that would be April to June. That's our blackout day. That is where we need our people full focus. And so that's the first question I would ask. They will tell you things you could never legally ask in an interview if you ask them this question specifically. Tell me about yourself. You can start anywhere and end anywhere. And then you're going to be quiet. All right, number two, the best friend question. The best friend question is this. I want you to ask the person, suppose I ran into your best friend at the airport. I want you to tell me what is the first name of your best friend? Okay? What is the first name of your best friend? All right? Then you're going to say, uh, what words, what three words would your best friend use to describe you? And of all of the people in the world, why did you choose them as your best friend? Okay? So what's the first name of your best friend? What three words would you use your, your best friend use to describe you? And of all of the people in the world, why did you choose them as your best friend? So maybe they say, you know what, my best friend, her name is Sarah May, she's just the greatest. 
I do? Well, Sarah would say that I have a good time, that I'm high energy, and that I never stop talking. <laughs> cool. All right, so what this question does is it tells you what they believe is true about themselves. Now, if you were to say, tell me, tell me about three things that describe me. They well, I'm a hard worker, I'm consistent, and I'm always on time. No, what Sarah said is you're always a good time, not always on time. You, you never stop talking and you're, you've always worked a part, whatever it was. That's what you truly believe about yourself. That's who you're hiring, not what they say they would describe themselves as. And then why of all the people you have met in this world did you choose Sarah as your best friend? So while I went through some really hard, dark times and as a result, Sarah was always there for me. Like, or, or I went through a time where I was really trying to refine myself and that was the person who was there. Whatever it is, again, they will tell you pieces of information about their life and what they're doing in that question that you would never ask. The final question I want you to ask is this is the background check question. The, the background check question is, assuming we run a full background check on you, is there anything you would like me to know before I run the background check? Okay, that's, assuming we run a full background check on you, is there anything I need to know before I run a background check? Why is this question important? Number one, we should be running a background check, right? Yes, we should be running a background check. Because there's something on the background check, does that exclude them from being at your dealership? No, unless it's something very specific, okay? But here's the deal, I want them to be honest with me. If we run the background check and there's something on there that they have not shared with me, that's more of a red flag when there's being something on the background check in the first place. Be honest with me. We all have baggage inside of our dealership. Whether it's you, whether it's me, whether it's somebody else that we hire, we all have baggage as we're in this. And it's just about deciding what baggage you want to bring into your dealership as an owner or manager and making that decision. The final thing I want to say before this rings for us in just a second, and you can go to the trade show floor, is that the best thing that you can do in the hiring process, especially with the speed that we're having trial period. This is legal in most states in the United States where you can do a trial period for 30, 60, or 90 days because every technician who walks into your dealership is the best technician in the world. Have you all experienced that? They're like, man, I should be paying dozens of what you're actually offered because I am the world's best technician. You go, that's cute. I love that for you. But what we're going to do is that we're going to do a trial period for 30 days and we're going to make sure that we are both really in a good place after 30 days. Maybe it's 60 days for you, maybe it's 90 days for you, but that trial period gives you the ability to reassess consistently and regularly and make sure that they are living up to what they said in this really quick interview process. Here's what I'm going to say as we wrap up. You guys have a big job. Right now, as we are looking at this hiring situation that we are in the midst of right now, you have a big job on your hands. Be consistent, follow your process, and make sure we bring the right people into the dealership because years down the line, you'll be thankful you followed the process.